Thank you. 
Well, welcome everybody. Let's see. It seems to in this session everyone can have a seat, so that's very good. Um, let's just start. I would like. Uh, I'm. My name is Sjord Panaise. I work for Hivos, and Hivos, the Hans A. Neumann Stiftung and Coffee and Climate, are welcoming you here at our session, which has a very long title: the role of agroecology in exploring innovative viable adaptation measures for resilient smallholder coffee landscapes. What we would like to do today is to give you an overview of the, well, f uh, the, the, the scene from the point of view of research, for which we have invited uh, Ina Poas of IID, Peter Verwey of the Copernicus Institute of the University of Utrecht, we have Martin van Zonneveld, he's researcher at Biodiversity International based in Costa Rica. And we have Stine Albrecht from the Hans Neumann Foundation, and she will give a more practical take on what would be possible. Um, and we are very lucky also to have uh, Mr. Galindo from the International Coffee Organization to uh, give some opening words. Um, and then, uh, to put this in perspective, we will have a discussion, which is also a discussion open with public questions, um, sort of reality check. How do we really go from all these interesting pilot projects to 
a certain scale that it's all right uh, that's also making a difference in the coffee sector and being an example in agriculture. Therefore, we have invited Ivania Caseda Villalobos. She's the Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Livestock of Costa Rica. We have Ms. Merlin Presa. She's Chair of Prodicop, Cooperative from Nicaragua. We have um, Peter van Metwout. He's the Director of the Gold Standard <coughs> Foundation. And Mr. Mario Ceruti. Um, Corporate Relations Director of Lavazza. Since we will be short on time, we are going to invite the International Coffee Organization to give the opening words. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like first and foremost to thank, on behalf of the International Co Coffee Organization, the organizers to host this session at the Global Landscape Forum. Uh, given the interdependence and um, in view of the coffee and the vulnerability in the coffee landscapes, it is of paramount importance to put the topic of coffee and climate change, like Michael Opitz, my friend here, directs the program, um, in, on our minds. Hence, I did not ex hesitate to accept the invitation to speak at this event. For billions of consumers around the globe, the day starts with a fresh cup of coffee, and uh, it's one of the most pleasurable day experiences. Uh, it is uh, the lubricant that uh, keeps our modern society in motion. For millions of producers, most of them smallholders in less developed countries, coffee is the main source of income. Growing coffee helps these rural families to make their ends meet, purchase food and clothes, or pay for their children's education. However, climate change poses a significant risk for the coffee production. We recognize this at the International Coffee Organization. This is why uh, over the last few years, we have invested significant effort, efforts to understand the latest developments on the co coffee climate science. We have worked closely with a number of people at this room. The IPCC is unequivocal. Climate change is having a severe impact on coffee production. It expects climate change to continue to impact coffee production in the future, especially considering the current vulnerability of coffee growing regions. Changing, changes in weather also impacts coffee quality. Coffee thrives under very specific ag agroclimatic uh, conditions. It needs the right temperature and the right level of rainfall. Rising global temperatures and a change in climate may greatly reduce the availability of these conditions. The IPCC scientists have told us that climate change can reduce the area of land that is suitable for coffee produce, production. They are also have told us how climate change could increase the occurrence of crop, crop pests and diseases like coffee leaf rust in Central America. In view of the tremendous change with uh, challenge uh, with uh, coffee climate, it is evident that we have a lot of work to do in the coming years. The good news is that we are already seeing countries and companies initiating action and progress to address these issues. The private sector takes it the challenge. Companies have begun to take mitigation and adaptation actions. The International Coffee Organization is attending this 21st conference of the parties uh, as an observer. We will continue to inform our members, the government of the coffee and consuming countries on this important topic. We will continue to work with a wide spectrum of organization to understand of uh, climate change. I invite you to all to join us. We need to make sure that we will be able to enjoy coffee in the years to come. Thank you.
Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm going to go straight forward talking about an economic instrument that is used as an, as an innovative financial mechanism to support the change to more um, sustainable practices. And I'm going to focus on coffee production. Um, so basically, this is uh, payments for ecosystem services. You may have heard about them. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, sorry. My name is Ina Porras. I work for the International Institute for Environment and Development. And I've been working on payments for ecosystem services uh, for many years, so before the term was even invented. So in this case, talking about terms, I'm going to only consider payments for ecosystem services as conditional transfers that are used to change behavior. So if we just think about that, that should be enough to guide us in the discussion into the coffee sector and what it means for coffee. So in, in terms of coffee and farmers, this means that there's going to be an incentive to change these farm practices um, so that they reduce, they, they result in the reduction of greenhouse emissions. Hopefully, it will result in better <laughs> yield, in more resilience, in better adaptation to climate change. Um, these um, practices will result in um, offsets that can be certified and that they can be sold internationally. So this is the, the type of projects that we are looking at. Um, they are being organized and sold through cooperatives. And we are also very interested, and we were very keen on exploring the potential for insetting, which is the new offsetting, is um, carbon credits and offsets that are sold through value changes. So what I'm really actually talking about is the experience that um, in a project together with HIVOS we did in the past two years, where we we were looking at smallholder agriculture, but we knew all of all the, 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 the obstacles that smallholder projects face entering carbon, carbon markets and ecosystem services markets. So we thought, OK, let's go and work with farmers that are already organized. They already have some access to inputs. They already have a basic, um, they already are located in markets. And then let's see if payments for ecosystem services work for them. And if it doesn't, then maybe this is time to turn around and find something else. So this is what we did. We went to Indonesia, Kenya. Uh, we looked at biogas with these farmers. We looked at coffee in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in Peru. We looked at reforestation as well in Peru and in Nicaragua. And we looked at the carbon credits and the offsets that are generated and sold. So these projects already are selling or very close to selling. All of these documents are new and freshly out of the press, and you can download them. We have some a synthesis report outside. Um, so I'm just going to go super quickly through an example from Peru, from Sierra Piura. In Sierra Piura, we have a, a really interesting case. Um, farmers, coffee farmers, are small. They're located in the middle parts of a, a watershed that is really deforested upstream, and this is affecting strongly this water. Um, the water resources and the quality and the regulation of these water resources downstream for the coffee farmers. Uh, so the coffee farmers, they will benefit from better land management upstream, but they cannot pay for this. So upstream, the, the people, they can reforest, but they don't have the means to in, in enter reforestation. Downstream, these farmers benefit, but they have no means to pay for that. So a solution that came in here from the, the proponents of this project was to actually use the coffee um, value chain to sell carbon credits are generated to the reforestation upstream, but then sell it through the coffee chain because this will be having a positive impact in the carbon market. So what we did was to look at this as a value proposition. We forgot this is not a subsidy, this is not a press, um, just some money that somebody will give us because they like us. It's a value proposition, and that's what we did. So we first went back to this case, and we looked at the value chain from the coffee. From the beginning, all of you who are involved in coffee will know this value chain. You won't be able to read it, but um, you can read it in the document. So from the beginning, the production, all the way to selling it. So we looked at who are the main organizations involved, uh, the cooperative at the local level, the, the, the big, larger scale cooperative, and then the, the buyers of this coffee, these coffee roasters. We also looked at who are the input suppliers. So who will be people who will be very useful if we were going to engage in these improved activities? So we look at these cases, and then we identify who will be the key people. This is just the coffee chain. And then we wanted to see, OK, within this structure, what is happening if we 
um, put the proposal of the insetting proposition. So now we link up this carbon, the new value chain of the carbon, but linking it up again together with the, with the coffee proposition. So we see again the insetting is targeting the buyers, the same coffee roasters, and trying to convince them to buy offsets as well from these projects. And this money will go all the way up again at the top of the watershed, and this will create many benefits. The, the, the um, coffee roasters will be helping to improve the, um, the, the, the supply at the base of the chain. Um, alongside, there's some new organizations that are created. Upstream, we only have subsistence farmers, so we needed to be able to organize them. Um, and then also, we have a new certification. We have gold standard coming in to certify these, that e effectively these carbon offsets are being created. So we looked at many cases like this, well, several of them, uh, with a lot of detail, cost benefits, who is involved, who is benefiting, who, who is not benefiting. Um, and then we realized that actually, yeah, the question was, can smallholders benefit? Yes, they can, actually. We saw many um, opportunities for farmers. We see that in these cases, they're already engaged in a high-value product, coffee. As you were saying, we all like our cup of coffee. Uh, there's already been invented e-cigarettes, but I don't think that I'm going to get an e-coffee, an e-cup of coffee anytime soon. Um, additional funding can really support this adaptation to climate change. Um, and there is also the potential to target other ecosystem services, as I was showing in here um, in the case of water. Cooperatives, if we work with these cooperatives, they are already organized. They have a, an infrastructure. It's already there. We're not inventing something from zero. They have access to inputs. They have access to buyers. They have already a portfolio of buyers. They have negotiation power as well. And in some countries, cooperative and coffee cooperative especially are incredibly powerful. Um, we also have these, these um, farmers are already used to the idea of certifiers, so they know about quality control. Um, they, they already, we, we have several standards that are very well known, fair trade, for example. They're already very well known, and these farmers already are used to being monitored. And then the buyers, of course. We have a segment of a market that have buyers that are informed. They have a, a higher willingness to pay in some cases. Um, but they also understand really strongly the risk of climate change for quality and for delivery. And, and they have a pressure from their shareholders as well to, to take into account this corporate social responsibility agenda. So the answer is, yes, it can. It can help. But there's also many challenges along the chain. I was trying to separate the challenges by the different uh, members, but actually um, we realized some of these challenges apply to all of them. Um, and, and all the way across the chain. So I just wanted to highlight a few of them. So the technical challenges are very strong still. There is a lot of learning on smallholder projects, but most of them are on forestry. Agriculture is still new. We're still learning. A lot of these are pilots. So we need to continue this learning process to make sure that we manage to get to streamline systems. Um, but then these holistic approaches, we need to make sure, especially with smallholder agriculture, that it has to benefit the farmers again. It just has to make a change at the base, at the farm level. But then these holistic approaches are still too expensive to be able to enter these carbon markets. Um, and we also found in the cases that we looked, there's a really big monopoly of information. It's still not tricking down. It's controlled by the technicians. It's sort of they're trying to keep the carbon markets like a mystic thing out there. Um, so it needs to be more. Uh, so the marketing, um, really strong. The price control, the price systems, uh, the prices are very low. And it's, uh, there's a standard overload. Um, the, co the cooperative and the groups don't have uh, these marketing um, skills. And we found a very uncertain benefit sharing agreement, agreement throughout this value chain. So we need to work a lot on this, this small capture per farm. And there's um, very little, uh, the, the, the benefit sharings have to be really strongly clear from the beginning, and it needs to be clear that it goes back again to the farm where the change in the climate change is going to, is going to take place. Uh, I'm going to stop here. So, yes, I think I went over 30 seconds. But... <laughs> so, you can read that. Well, <laughs> yes.
to introduce yourself. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pieter Verwey. I'm based at Utrecht University, the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development. Uh, I'm assistant professor there, and um, I'm here together uh, with my colleague uh, Rosaline Yezir. Rosaline, please raise your hand, to present you the results of a report commissioned by HIFOS uh, on shade-grown coffee. Uh, the question is whether there is a double dividend for biodiversity and small-scale farmers in Peru. Um, Short talked about um, upscaling. And um, of course, then the question is, is there really a business case for uh, biodiversity friendly uh, enterprises overall? Uh, we did a report earlier on for HIVOS, which was focused on a broader issue regarding uh, biodiversity friendly business cases. And we saw in that report that they can generate biodiversity benefits <laughs> and as well, uh, socio-economic benefits. So for a wide range of cases across the, top, across the tropics, we found that indeed uh, there were these double uh, positive effects. And uh, at our institute, we also do research into uh, agro-commodities, and the question is there, uh, how can biodiversity be addressed in more sustainable uh, value chains? For instance, for oil palm, for soy, sugarcane, cocoa. And there as well we see uh, important opportunities to reconcile agriculture with biodiversity conservation. Talking about upscaling, uh, the trends we see in reality across the tropics when talking about um, coffee is that there is the opposite uh, trend going on of uh, replacement of shade-grown coffee by full sun monocultures, which are, of course, uh, less biodiversity friendly, biodiversity hostile, we should say, maybe. Um, however, there is a myth regarding these full sun uh, plantations, and that is that they're better in terms of productivity and therefore also in, term, in terms of farmers' income. However, the question is whether that is really true. And that is we wanted to investigate, uh, because uh, for that purpose you would need a full cost-benefit analysis. So the objective of our study was to gain more insight into the business case, especially of uh, shade uh, coffee systems and its relation to biodiversity performance. And we did such a case study uh, in Peru where uh, lots of small, small farmers, uh, smallholders are engaged in coffee cultivation. Worldwide, we also see large numbers of smallholders, 25 million farmers engaging in um, coffee cultivation. And we measured uh, different indicators for uh, economic performance, for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And we did some um, measurements of landscape characteristics as well. Uh, in particular, because the, our region of interest is uh, subjected to uh, forest fragmentation and deforestation. So the question also was, uh, is the presence of forest somehow favorable uh, for the biodiversity and economic performance of those plantations? And you see here our study areas uh, in circles. Um, then the first dimension of our study, uh, economic performance. If we compare conventional full sun monoculture here on the left hand side with agroforestry, Labor costs are very similar. But if we look into more detail, we see that there are substantial differences regarding uh, the division of labor. And we see that uh, a lot of uh, labor uh, is hired in the conventional case, whereas the costs involved in higher labor for agroforestry is lower. And the same holds true for uh, all kind of agrochemical inputs we see again that in the full sun intensified system, of course, these agrochemical inputs are more costly 
So the costs involved are overall higher than uh, for the agroforestry system. If we add to that uh, fertilizer input, uh, the balance becomes even more unfavorable for the full sun, for the full sun system. Of course, we have to look at the dimension of benefits as well. And we see if we compare the two systems that um, the benefits from other products are very substantial in the case of agroforestry, which is logical, of course. But in our study, we try to quantify these benefits. And we see that in particular regarding timber, there is huge potential for additional income. Uh, besides timber, there is also some additional income from uh, fruits, firewood, uh, livestock. Um, those are the main categories. If we have a look at net revenues, uh, we see initially uh, that there is no real difference between conventional and agroforestry if we look at coffee income alone. And maybe that is also a new insight that the net revenues from full sun systems are not necessarily higher uh, in comparison to agroforestry. So we saw in our study that coffee yield is not really a comprehensive indicator. In the scientific literature, there is a lot of emphasis on productivity as the main indicator often. And for farmers themselves, it's the main motivation to shift to um, full sun monoculture. Um, we see that coffee quality is also very important and often in relation to agroforestry quality is better so farmers are able to obtain better prices. Uh, market access is also often better uh, guaranteed but that depends on level of organization of course and that organization is often facilitated by uh, certification. However, if we look at additional um, sources of income, the balance again becomes different. And we see that especially revenues uh, of timber um, make a significant impact here. So the balance overall, uh, if costs and revenues are taken into account, is uh, very favorable for agroforestry. Then uh, the biodiversity performance, the other dimension of our study. Um, we took as proxies uh, butterfly richness and also richness of tree species. And I'll highlight in my presentation for the sake of time only the butterflies. And we see that uh, in the conventional system, biodiversity is lower, of course, in comparison to agroforestry because of the shade trees. Shade trees attract a lot of biological diversity, including butterflies. And we see that a large share of the species that are present in forests also occur in our agroforestry plantations. And if we look at forest habitat specialists alone, so those species related most to the forest, we see again that in our agroforestry system, uh, the balance is positive. Also for other ecosystem services, we see uh, these favorable effects. In terms of carbon stocks, we had significant uh, differences. In terms of microclimate control, uh, soil nitrogen uh, content as well. So all kind of uh, positive effects in terms of ecosystem services. Altogether, uh, we see that indeed uh, a double dividend is possible uh, for our uh, case study. Uh, we see uh, that there are uh, important effects in terms of improved productivity of several different uh, products. So there is also div diversification of income uh, possible uh, through the agroforestry system. Uh, we see positive effects in terms of increased market access for uh, smallholder farmers. Um, not only for coffee, but also for other products. But of course, uh, some more progress need to be uh, made there. Especially the timber products um, would require some uh, improved market access. And we see a beneficial effect of certification. 
Uh, in the enabling environment, in our report, we uh, generate several uh, recommendations. And uh, a very important one is uh, technical assistance. It depends a lot whether technical assistance uh, focus exclusively on uh, full sun monoculture technological packages and trying to sell uh, fertilizers and other agrochemical inputs or whether there is more emphasis on the benefits of tree species and which tree species need to be planted then. Um, if uh, such a business case can be realized for agroforestry, maybe we need very little incentives to make this work. And incentives for tree planting, for instance, maybe in a large number of cases would be sufficient without any uh, additional need for uh, complementary incentives. And finally, uh, we see that uh, in terms of ecosystem services, it is not only about uh, a positive biodiversity performance, but also in terms of uh, increased resilience to pests and diseases, we saw some important effects that, however, need some uh, further research. And uh, due to the larger carbon stocks in agroforestry systems, we can say that uh, these have increased potential uh, regarding climate mitigation. And on the other hand, we also measured a more favorable microclimate in terms of uh, relative humidity and temperature. So there is also the effect of uh, climate mitigation. Thank you very much. Good evening. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Maarten van Zonneveld, Maarten for short. I am a researcher working for Biodiversity International, which is one of the 15 CG centers, and which is the CG center which is uh, doing research on agriculture biodiversity uh, to improve people's lives. Um, I'm going to present some first results of a collaborative project uh, between different organizations, uh, Biodiversity International, the University of Vermont, HIFOS, SEDECO, which is a Costa Rican-based organization, the World Agroforestry Center, and this project is part of a bigger research program, uh, which is called CCAFS, Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security. So, when we think about um, coffee landscapes and climate change, uh, these landscapes are going to change on the progress of climate change. So we have a transformation of coffee systems and also the f coffee farmer livelihoods under these changes. And if no adaptation measures are being taken, you probably will change uh, the system into an, uh, uh, an undesired uh, state. For example, after an extreme event like a drought uh, and the resulting crop failure, the most vulnerable uh, smallholders may mi migrate to the city where they may even live under more marginal conditions than in the rural areas. Or they may choose to change their coffee system uh, to, uh, sub, uh, to a system with a subsistent crop, like maize, with, with, uh, with uh, which they earn less, and also the system provides less ecosystem services. They may also sell their land and start working as uh, loan workers, day workers, for other uh, farmers. So this transformation has profound impacts on the power relationships within these landscapes. And la finally, um, there are also very likely negative impacts on environment through land use change. So how can we provide solutions so that uh, these farmers uh, can transform their system in a desirable way? Uh, and in our case, we are looking at the adoption of agroecological practices, for example, shade in coffee systems or the adoption of soil conservation measures, but also diversification with other cash crops. Um, oops. Um, and also food security and food uh, sovereignty, so that people uh, have sufficient food even though coffee prices may be low. So that in the end, the coffee system may change and will change on the climate change, but it will change in a desirable way 
uh, for both coffee growers and coffee buyers and coffee consumers. Mm. So when we think about uh, the adoption of agroecological practices, we have to recognize that farmers need to invest in these practices, which it costs time and money. So one of the questions is in this project is how are farmers' response capacities connected to the adaptation to climate change through the implementation of agroecological practices? And the second question, how can farmers' implementation of agroecological practices be connected to investment plan that facilitates uh, their efforts in, in terms of finance? Mm. So we built a model. Um, we begin with agroecological practices that, in general, we can assume that when farmers adopt agroecological practices like soil conservation, shade, um, appropriate pruning, they may increase the productivity of their coffee uh, systems. And with the adoption of uh, agroecological practices, they may reduce the sensitivity of a production system towards extreme climate events. And with that, they uh, buffer against the negative impacts of these uh, negative climate impacts. Uh, and then with an increased productivity, uh, the farmer's well-being and response capacity may increase uh, because of more income. And with that, farmers are more able to invest again in agroecological practices. Um, of course, in the field we know that there's, there are many challenges in the adoption of agroecological practices, so we would need investment to support implementation. And for that, we would require investment plans which are both economically solid as well as ecological sound. So we test this model in two pilot areas in Central America, uh, which is uh, one of the areas in the world which is very vulnerable uh, to climate change, um, with one uh, farmer association in Guatemala, Asobagri, in Huehuetenango, uh, to which more than 1,000 Mayan coffee growers' families are associated. And in Nicaragua, with Prodocop, uh, which is a second level cooperative, to which more than 2,000 farmers are affiliated. Hmm. So here I'm going to present some of our first results uh, where we try to connect the implementation of agroecological practices. So on the I also, uh, um, I axis, you will see diversity of AA practices. Well, that's agroecological practices. So this includes um, the soil conservation, pruning, shade, the establishment of living barriers, uh, terracing, etc. And on the um, x-axis, you will see um, food security scores. So FS is food security. FE is food insecure. So you have mildly food insecure. You have moderately food insecure. And severely food insecure. So severely food insecure is worse. So what you can see here is that um, farmers of um, Prodocop, those that have implemented more agroecological practices are also the ones that are most food secure, as you will see. Uh, you see here the bar, the box plot um, of FS, food security. Those have also uh, the highest diversity of agroecological practices, even though the number is quite low. But even though also the mildly food insecure farmers have also implemented a high number of agroecological practices. So this is the first indication that there is a positive interplay between application of agroecological practices and farmers' livelihoods. We also compared the diversity of agroecological practices with um, progress out of poverty scores, which is a standard uh, score, which is used in many countries uh, by uh, um, microfinancers, etc. And we also applied it. So here on the x-axis, uh, you see the poverty scores. Uh, out of poverty scores from very low, 20, so that means that uh, uh, farmer families are very poor, towards 70, which means that they are al already going out of poverty and can build a good house, can uh, afford several things which make uh, life more easy. Um, and as you see also here, there's a positive relationship uh, and a significant relationship between 
the progress out of poverty and the application of agroecological practices. So again, this interplay is, is quite encouraging to understand, uh, to, to really have evidence that application of these agroecological practices has a positive effect on farmers' well-being, which then will have again a positive effect on the application of agroecological practices to eventually make these coffee landscapes more climate resilient. So, to support farmers in, um, in the application of these practices, you also need an enabling environment. And at a landscape level, these cooperators are key because they provide technical assistance, they facilitate an access to credit, they incentive also women and youth to be involved, they encourage diversification, and also, in some cases, they acknowledge the importance of improving food security and food sovereignty. However, there are several challenges in, in Guatemala, Nicaragua, and similar countries because of lack of funding, the constant changes in government and laws. There's a high bu bureaucracy in many processes involved, taxes, and in several projects, and I guess our project is also one of external agents, they're often overlapping and not necessarily well aligned with the institutional objectives. So what can we expect from a national level? Um, so in our study, we found that in Guatemala and in Nicaragua, laws related to sustainable coffee production exist, but they're not effectively implemented. Public funding schemes fail to reach small farmers. I think these are the usual suspects, no? Um, public coffee institu uh, institutions are uh, existing, but insuffic insufficiently financed. There's a lack of coordination between institutions and their unclear land tenure rights. Well, despite all these challenges, I would like to finish with the positive uh, ending, which is the investment plan that Protocop is implementing with support of Sedeco and HIVOS. So this is a biofertilizer processing plant uh, where coffee growers affiliated to Protocop can buy organic fertilizer as a good agriculture practices to improve productivity and their well-being. And in addition, this helps to store carbon, which is an additional benefit. And the interesting thing is that this investment plan is ecological solid and also economically sound, uh, with a time of investment recovery after five years and with an internal rate of return of 15 to 21 percent. So how can this investment plan, this case study, inspire us to develop other investment plan to allow the upscaling of agroecological practices uh, with these cooperatives. So I end with three questions for discussion. Uh, what are effective mechanisms for private sector to support coffee farmers coping with climate change? What type of institutional support is required for an enabling environment to build climate resilient coffee landscapes? And what is the role of carbon credits in sustaining investment plans? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dina Albrecht, and I work for the Hans Neumann Foundation, and I'm program manager of the Initiative for Coffee and Climate. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and to introduce you to our work within the initiative and to present you some of our practical experiences on climate change adaptation for smallholder coffee farmers at farm level. Um, yeah, short introduction, as you can see, the Initiative for Coffee and Climate is a pre-competitive public-private partnership, and um, most of the leading coffee companies are part of it, but also some public partners. And we started five years ago in 2010 um, within a pilot framework um, with four southern farmers in four different, different regions in Tanzania, Vietnam, Brazil and Trefino, the triangle border of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And we are now at a stage where we are ready to scale. So how do we work? We have developed and um, refined within the last years um, a participatory methodology, a so-called CNC approach, coffee and climate approach, which we found out works in the field. It's a process for supporting smallholder 
um, in climate change actions. And you can see a problem in a solution domain, and um, it's a five-step approach. The steps build up in each other. We started with a step one, setting the scene. Is climate change really an issue in the area? If yes, we moved on to um, step two, the assessment of climate change challenges. And that, of course, depends highly on the availability of data and information. And thus, we use a very practical approach. We, um, oh, sorry. we collect data or information from the farmers themselves, doing farm diagnostics on their plot. We are also uh, um, involving extension workers or technicals and scientists, local research institutes. And where all the three sources deliver, uh, deliver similar results, the level of accuracy is the highest. And this also leads us to identify adaptation options, which might be appropriate for a given region. Step three is then the adaptation planning. Um, yeah, from the list we have identified an earlier step, we then select or prioritize the one we want to implement in a given region. Step four is action in the field. There are some low or no regret measures which can be implemented and disseminated straightforward, but other has to be further validated and tested together with the farmers on their plot if they really work in a given environment. Because sometimes the technical performance or the eff effectiveness of an adaptation options differ from region to region or from village to village and also from altitude to altitude. And the last step of this learning process is um, the assessment of the lessons learned and the documentation together with the farmers and stakeholders we have involved right from the beginning. So I would like to show you by uh, a case study of using cover crops in Honduras, how we work in the field together with the farmers, how we validate the technical performance of an adaptation option. And here you see the cover crops Bracaria, that's the grass between the coffee trees on the second photo. And we measured here soil temperature, because this is a quite interesting indicator as soil temperature raises with the air temperature and also with sun exposure. And um, you might also know that this little coffee bean is highly or particularly sensitive to climate variation. Coffee thrives in a relative narrow temperature range, means um, an extended period above 33 degrees affect the coffee growth and the coffee hulls, um, and thus its productivity. And in the end, of course, it reduces the income of the coffee farmers. So here, it's really the focus on cooling down the coffee production system. And you can see the soil temperature is more stable and reduced. And a co-benefit is, of course, that soil erosion is also reduced and the level of soil moisture increases. This slide just summarizes the results. And here, we, you can see a photo taken by a drone with a plot A, the control group, where business as usual was applied, the traditional farm management. On plot C, the cover crops, Bracaria, and on plot C, we even t added temporary shade. And here, um, the results demonstrate how the impact of extreme soil temperature on the root of the coffee plant and on the health of the coffee plant can be mitigated when cover crops are introduced. And the effect is even higher when you have added temporary shade. What are the results um, with regard to the adoption rate? Um, you see on the right that for the cover crops in Chifinho, the adoption rate is now by almost 80%. And due to the coffee rice crisis some years ago, we focused very much on rust management activities in Chifinho. I will not go through the other adaptation options in the other regions. It's just to highlight or to show you the very positive and encouraging trend and that we introduce different adaptation options for other regions. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. It's always um, location-specific solutions required based on participatory local risk assessments. 
As we work in a pre-competitive manner, we share all our knowledge and findings and we set up um, an online platform, the so-called Coffee and Climate Toolbox, Toolbox, where you can find the case study about the cover crops in Honduras, but also other case studies from the other regions, um, a training manual, some climate maps and practical examples of local risk assessments. Where do we stand right now? Um, I said we are ready to scale, and for the scaling phase, we set the target to reach 70,000 farmers through the ongoing validation and training in the four key regions, the former um, pilot regions, but also beyond through, through using um, the networks of CNC and implementation structures of the CNC members and here we offer um, training of trainer format and backstopping services. And a third component is that we would like to upscale or further develop the CNC approach and um, are now looking into community-based and ecosystem-based adaptation and see coffee and climate as an element in landscape concept. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, please feel, be invited to have a look at the website and check out the toolbox regularly. Further case study will be available. Thanks. Thank you. Now, welcome to the panel. Um, we have uh, said that we would also like uh, to discuss uh, some of the um, next challenges to, to take. Um, just briefly, my name is Michael Opitz. I'm um, Managing Director of uh, the Neumann Foundation. And uh, who, those of you who might not know our foundation, we are a stakeholder in the coffee sector. Um, we are providing a platform function for um, industry, connecting them uh, with development cooperation um, and bringing the both of them together to the field to cooperate with producers on a global scale. Um, I think uh, what comes through the presentation already is that the agenda is huge. We have, um, I think, a challenge in our sector to, to shape the future landscapes where coffee is going to be produced. Um, but we also at the same time need to provide perspectives for the producers, their families, for the communities, and very important, for the young generation. So that they're actually um, the taking over of responsibilities for um, the landscapes and for the protection of the natural resources is going to be, um, you know, to, be to rest on, on their shoulders. We need to ensure at the same time food security and definitely economic growth. So the agenda is, is huge, but things I think um, from the presentation it became clear that there are quite a few um, of the options um, available in uh, which we can apply in field operations. So let's talk about scaling. Let's talk about how we can take this experience to a larger level. Let's talk about speed, because I think the time is ticking. That also became very clear in the discussions here at the COP and at the Global Landscape Forum the time horizon is, is very limited. And we also need to crack paradigms, um, as was mentioned um, already, that shade-grown coffee is superior to um, un unshaded coffee. I think that's something which we really need to get into the heads of peers in our coffee sector. So I'm happy to have very good experts on the panel. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Freiberg from the, the German Ministry of um, environment, he couldn't make it. He's caught in the COP negotiations, so we will uh, deal without him. He would basically connect us to the overall um, discussions of um, INDCs and uh, UNFCCC network. Anyway, I think we found our spot, or you will find our spot there. So um, I think we introduced already um, briefly our speakers. We have from the left um, Mario Ciruti from Lavazza. We have Merling. Um, Benza from Prodecop, 
We have um, Ivania Quesada from um, Costa Rica, the Vice Minister of, of Agriculture, and we have Peter van Mietbord from um, the Gold Standard. Um, we will have one guided question to all of our uh, panelists um, on which they can elaborate for about two, three minutes before we then open uh, the discussion to all of you. So please feel invited uh, to um, participate afterwards in, in the discussions. Um, if there are specific questions, um, we can also then invite our uh, presenters, uh, our speakers, to maybe uh, form part of, um, of the discussions. Okay, so my first question would go to Mario Ciruti. Um, Mario, he has, um, as mentioned, working for Lavazza, and Lavazza definitely is a very dedicated coffee company. Um, they are working in development cooperation next to farmers since almost 15 years now in projects uh, around the globe, um, so a track record that is, um, that is available. And they also are a founding member to Coffee and Climate. The question, Mario, is um, looking into the experiences that we have been seeing here and uh, seeing that we in Coffee and Climate only envisage 70,000 farmers for the next phase, while there are, you were mentioning, 25 million producers that are out there. Um, how can we reach them? What is the Lavazza position and what is the plan, actually, to take action? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. So, uh, well, uh, here we, we really would love to have more time, but uh, to make it very short, uh, I have to say that when we started this project five years ago, we were still discussing if climate change was or not anthropogenic. Today, um, leaders in the world are saying it's the last chance. So in five years, everything changed. Now, in coffee is the last chance. Now, what do we do with this project? We started with small things, pilot, 3,000 people. Now we're planning 70,000. From the project point of view, is a fantastic achievement. It's 20 times more. But of course, looking at the coffee production, 25 million families, and probably if we consider <coughs> all the people involved, we are 100 or whatever, it doesn't matter, but a lot of people. We have to scale up in a completely different way as we did in the other part. So we are here to launch a statement that will be available in, uh, in, uh, in, in paper, and we'll be in our website, et cetera, et cetera. And the statement commit ourselves as a private uh, uh, and, and also some of the uh, organization, NGO and the government organization participating in the project to do certain things. But the key point is that we have to really embark all of you, many of this information that uh, was already uh, said here is very important, but to commit all of you to commit the government to participate. If we don't scale up at government level, if we don't have the extension system, if we don't have the government uh, uh, agricultural minister or, or, or whatever to participate in these activities, in putting together all the knowledge we all collectively have into helping the grower uh, of course, talking about coffee, but it would be probably the same for many other commodity and any other product. If we don't really align our forces, uh, we probably not really get uh, where, where we should go. So this is our commitment, and we, we, are, we are going to do a roadshow. We are going to knock the door of every uh, <laughs> agricultural minister that we can, we can think about. We, can, we will knock the door to other companies to join in, in this uh, totally pre-competitive effort. And so well, that's the only thing we can, we can do right now, besides our, <laughs> our own uh, um, activities, our own uh, forces. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mario. You want this one? Yeah, maybe it's, it's uh, the one that really works. Um, thank you, Mario. Uh, I think you threw the, the ball directly to Ivania. Um, Ivania is um, the vice minister, as mentioned, for um, agriculture in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica, um, for those uh, of you who are not um, already so into the coffee sector, it's the first country in the coffee sector that was able to um, establish a coffee nama. So, um, Ivania, I think, um, 
congratulations first to this big achievement. And let's hear from you what are the key learnings um, that you take away as a government representative uh, for supporting smallholder farmers with such kind of an, uh, of an initiative. And what would be your recommendations for other coffee producing countries in, in this context? Be prepared uh, to receive a Spanish re reply. Buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Bueno, ya me presentaban. Soy viceministra. El ministro está por ahí afuera. Nosotros sí estamos en la parte pública. Y no solo tenemos un arreglo institucional en eh, la parte pública, sino la parte privada y la parte institucional en Costa Rica. De tal manera que todo el sector cafetalero y el político está unido. Y hemos este, desarrollado una iniciativa, una iniciativa que le hemos eh, llamado Nama Café. Y bueno, lastimosamente solo tenemos tres minutos porque me gustaría contarles más ampliamente de qué se trata. Pero el mayor consejo es que cuando queremos llegar a los productores tenemos que llegar con un tema de productividad. Difícilmente podemos llevar a cabo prácticas eh, en, en donde podamos cuidar y proteger la biodiversidad, nuestros cuerpos de agua, los suelos, etc. Si no empezamos por un tema de productividad. Y es así como este Nama Café, entonces eh, tenemos todo lo que es el tema agroforestal. Tenemos dos temas, dos prácticas muy importantes en fincas cafetaleras, que es el tema agroforestal y el uso racional de los fertilizantes. Entonces, con eso eh, deseamos ayudar en, la, en el tema productivo a los productores y este, escalar a otros temas que serían entonces ya la parte de industrialización. Pero para mí el mayor consejo que, que le puedo dar a otros países es que debemos de mejorar la calidad de vida de sus productores, llevar desarrollo y riqueza a esas áreas rurales, en donde nos hace falta mucho de los servicios y de mejorar la calidad de vida de sus productores. Y a partir de eso, entonces, podemos hablar y escalar a otro tipo de iniciativas. Eso es lo que hemos hecho un poco. ¿verdad? En Costa Rica ya tenemos este, esta iniciativa y entonces está, estamos protegiendo la biodiversidad, el agua, el suelo, mayor eh, materia orgánica en el suelo con el tema de la sombra y también la productividad. Un tema muy importante con, con este Nama Café es que tenemos un componente muy importante de, de medición. Entonces, este también este es un plan piloto en donde queremos medir cuál es el impacto de estas medidas. Eso es lo que vamos a iniciar. Eh, ahí les contaremos cuáles van a ser los resultados porque también queremos compartir la experiencia. Um, thank you so much, um, Ivania. Maybe um, still a word for the second uh, part of, uh, of the initial question. Um, what would you recommend to other coffee producing countries based on your experiences? With the coffee nama. Bueno, yo eh, lo que recomiendo es iniciar una iniciativa en donde definitivamente están involucrados el gobierno, los productores, eh, la, la parte institucional en el caso de nosotros en Costa Rica es el café. Este, eh, desde un inicio con este tipo de iniciativas como la Manama Café y también involucrar a otras instituciones, por ejemplo, el sector financiero es muy importante para poder desarrollar estas iniciativas en, en los productores. Nosotros ya lo hemos estado este, iniciando, ¿verdad? tenemos eh, un, un, un tema que se llama banca de desarrollo, en donde le podemos estar llegando al productor con condiciones aptas para la producción de café, este, y poder desarrollar estas prácticas. Entonces, es un poco eh, lo que sería mi consejo, ¿verdad? Eh, igualmente en ese sentido de, de unirnos todos para, para mejorar la productividad y los co-beneficios que se pueden desarrollar en las fincas de los cafetaleros. Ok, thanks, Ivania. Um, the next question would go to Peter, and I think um, the word was already mentioned, the magic word, measurement. Um, Peter is uh, director of uh, the Gold Standard, um, so the question would be what can the coffee sector actually expect um, from the Gold Standard, in particular from the further development, from the evolving concept of the Gold Standard, and how does it um, support a, a sustainable and viable coffee production? 
Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so some of you might know as the gold standard, uh, we started in the days that the CDM was starting and we wanted to avoid that the CDM would be a carbon destruction mechanism, but actually a clean development mechanism. So um, we built additional rules, both on the governance processes as on the sustainable development impact that we wanted CDM projects to have. And we were somehow successful, I think, for a relatively small organization. We have over a thousand projects now on the ground that really through carbon markets have, um, uh, have been able to, uh, to deliver their impacts. But what we also see is that they're increasingly looking in other markets, other outcomes that they can get financed. Um, we have getting the first experience with black carbon reductions that have direct health impact. And it is exactly the measurement of such outcomes that triggers new donor funds and, and also new uh, investment opportunities. So we are working at the moment on a new version of the gold standard, which we call gold standard version 3.0. And this version 3, which comes out next year, um, is really going to function as a meta standard in which we can have intersectoral projects. So all kinds of different activities can be worked systematically through this standard. Um, all kinds of activities that work on the topic of climate security and sustainable development are able to use this standard to, uh, to structure their uh, project around the new sources of finance that are coming. And for the sustainable development aspect, we're looking at the sustainable development goals as our, as our leading framework. So we really want to be the standard with which you can show your progress towards the sustainable development goals on the ground in your activities. Um, and then to work towards adaptation, um, increase of production, and uh, water security is going to be a big topic as well. So what can you expect from us in the coming years, as was part of the question, is to further um, innovate this and pioneer together with you. Um, it is really uh, our commitment to work on in this complex world on tools that work on the ground. And we do that by working very closely with partners that, that are with their boots in the field every day. Um, strategically, but also really grassroots organizations. So we work with uh, WWF, but we also work with HIFOS, we work with the Cool Farm Tool Alliance, we work with Fairtrade, all these organizations that we can learn from, can use the tools to adapt them under Gold Standard 3.0, and which you can then use to report and measure the impact your activities are having. So we have the first experiences already with this, also in the agriculture and coffee sector. For example, in Peru, uh, the project has been demonstrated already, one of the first projects that was very successfully able to mobilize new resources uh, to protect uh, coffee production um, with uh, the Cooperativo of uh, Norandino. We're working in Ethiopia with uh, Oromia, and we're working, of course, in Nicaragua with Clodecop. And each of these initiatives are at different stages, have different challenges, uh, but we're really convinced that just through this new gold standard framework that we're offering, uh, we can add a lot of value to the, um, to the needed investments and, and progress that has to be made to the uh, sustainable development goals in the decades to come. Yeah. Quite um, an interesting, I think, approach and um, very promising um, let's say way further to um, enhance a standard that started just for trying to measure um, the availability and the, the storage capacity for uh, carbon in clean development mechanisms. Um, now let's look into uh, the producer level. Uh, next to me I have uh, Merling Presa, who is um, the general manager of um, a smallholder cooperative in Nicaragua called Prodecop. Um, they have like uh, 2,300 uh, smallholder farmers as members who are structured in 39 member associations and they have um, also achieved the fair trade certification years back. Um, you should also know um, that they have been featured in a, in a film uh, called After the Harvest, um, Addressing Hunger in the Coffee Lands, which was produced by Green Mountain some years ago emphasizing that uh, even with certification, people are still facing uh, different uh, uh, difficult times in terms of food security. So, Melling, um, with all the good, let's say, opportunities that we have been um, able to listen to, with all the good ideas, with all the initiatives, 
um, that are being developing in, in the coffee sector. First, what are the possibilities, what is the potential for the producers to, um, to improve their influence on taking decisions around um, further um, yeah, promoting sustainable coffee production? And second, um, what would be required from your perspective um, that farmers really um, are able to establish, um, yeah, let's say, superior production systems, more resilient production systems, and to more effectively protect forests? Gracias. Dos preguntas bastante difíciles, ¿verdad? Y para tres minutos y después de escuchar todas las ponencias anteriores, que también tengo una cantidad de preguntas para las ponencias anteriores. Pero eh, los, los productores pequeños que somos la mayoría en el sector café, en mi país el 95% somos pequeños productores y productoras, y estamos principalmente organizados en cooperativas para poder participar en el mercado como ya explicaron antes, con diferentes proyectos para tratar de adaptarnos y enfrentar los cambios climáticos. Cuando escucho las diferentes propuestas que hay alrededor de cómo trabajar el tema, es complicado porque estar en el campo es difícil. Día a día enfrentamos el cambio climático, se trata de la vida de la gente, se trata de cómo nosotros podemos enfrentar y podemos sobrevivir, no es de que se ve bonito cuidar el medio ambiente o no, sino que de cómo sobrevivimos en un mundo como este. Los ejemplos mostrados, tanto yo quisiera estar como Perú, ¿verdad? con unos suelos tan lindos como eso, porque el tema de productividad en nuestro país es bastante difícil. Producir con café bajo sombra significa producir menos café, porque los árboles de sombra no producen café. Eso significa menores ingresos para los productores. Entonces, la relación de cuidar el medio ambiente, es mucho eh, costo para el productor y menos ingreso. Entonces creo que eso es una de las cosas que en algún momento se presentó como que es casi igual. Yo creo que en nuestro país no es así. Tenemos condiciones muy diferentes. Hay estudios que dicen que si no cuidamos nuestro medio ambiente, en el 2050 no vamos a tener café en Nicaragua. Y eso significa más de 40.000 productores que no van a tener de qué vivir. Entonces tenemos que trabajar para eso. Creemos que las herramientas que se presentan tienen que ir acompañadas de recursos. Difícilmente vas a hacer prácticas si no tienes los recursos. Entonces, herramientas como la que se presentó, electrónica, buenas prácticas que hay, alguien tiene que transferirlas y transferirlas necesita recursos. Yo decía, sí, hay muy buenas experiencias, pero depende principalmente de recursos. En el caso del proyecto nuestro, nosotros trabajamos eh, con IVOS y y CEDECO para tratar de definir la norma para café agroecológico en, de gol estándar. Aprendimos el tema de la captura de carbono, pero por sí misma no significa nada para los pequeños productores. Si eso no va acompañado de inversión, inversión en mejora de nuestro suelo, inversión en el cuidado de las aguas, inversión para poder retribuirle al suelo. Los suelos se gastan y si no les retribuimos no, lo, no vamos a lograr sobrevivir. Okay, thank you, um, Melling. I think you really got from all the presentation quite an ample panorama of uh, the potentials, but at the same time also the huge challenges that we do have in, in our coffee sector. Um, what came out, I think, is the strong commitment that um, all the different stakeholders have. It's a question actually of, of getting it uh, together, getting the act together and getting active. With this, I would like to invite you now um, to also come up with your, with your questions. We have one here, one there. So there are two already. Three. I saw three hands coming up. Um, maybe we have a microphone that we can send around. Uh -huh. What? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Please present yourself briefly and then. My name is Emil Frieson. I'm uh, on the board of Eco Agriculture Partners. I have actually a question for Mia. The results that she showed are very eloquent to the potential of, of agroforestry, but was there any political economy analysis done at the same time? Who is pushing for 
the shift away from shade coffee to uh, full, uh, full uh, field, full sun coffee? I think we get further more questions before we then ask um, Mia to, to start addressing them. Uh, yes, my name is Miriam Ross, Universiteit, University of Amsterdam. Uh, I have a related question. Uh, I hear um, Merlin Pressa saying that cultivating uh, under shaded coffee means less production um, and, and that contradicts a bit the results of Peter's work, um, which indicates that it's more beneficial. Um, but we also saw that the fact that it is, uh, in, in economic terms, more beneficial is to be attributed to additional income based on timber. But that's a one-time um, harvest. So I wonder how the, the comparison was made. And if it's really true that agroforestry is more beneficial, why is this continuing trend towards the tra um, transformation towards monoculture ongoing? One, one more question before we then start the answer. Uh, Fabrice de Kirk from uh, Biodiversity. Un placer tenerles. Mi hija es tica, pasé seis años en Costa Rica. Es un placer tenerles aquí. Uh, my, my question is relates to a bit of the Costa Rican system, and there's, there's a huge diversity of, of shade systems. I think we, we don't need to think there's sun and shade, and, and that's it, because there's a really big, big range of different shade systems. But in Costa Rica, uh, last year, I think I recall the Ministry of Environment stating that the FONAFIFO Payment Freedom Service Program had reached its maximum for reforestation and was now looking to agriculture. And so my question is, do we see payment for custom services such as the Fiona FIFO scheme as a means to support the shaded systems in Costa Rica and particularly targeting them to the water benefits that Ina was referring to, which farms provide those benefits and can we bring that payment system into supporting farmers and those services for downstream communities? Okay, thanks. I think then we start uh, with, with Pia, no? Thank you. Um, the first question was whether we did a political economical analysis. Uh, the answer is straightforward. No, we didn't do that. Uh, we saw that in the region of uh, San Martin, uh, where we did research, uh, there has been a transition from shade grown coffee to full sun, but we didn't uh, analyze the underlying factors. We do, however, see that there is a stratification in the landscape and that often full sun is grown um, in the lower lying areas, uh, probably also on more fertile soils. So it is necessary to take into account variation in natural conditions. Um, then the question is, why is this transition uh, taking place? Uh, probably partly because there is a, a, a very strong focus on productivity and indeed in full sun systems uh, a higher productivity can uh, sometimes be realized but then uh, the costs of such intensification in terms of agrochemical inputs are often not uh, taken into account so that's what we did in our study and then the agroforestry system uh, turns out to be more favorable. Uh, of course, uh, different time scales are involved there, uh, because for uh, the timber revenues, you need longer time scales for these revenues to uh, occur. And in this case, uh, the revenues were calculated on the present value of the current timber stock, which has an age of about uh, seven years. So the average age of the timber trees is seven years. That means that after a cycle of 20 years, the revenues can be even higher. Not all farmers uh, take these timber trees uh, to the markets. So market access for timber products is also an issue. Uh, but if you would do so, um, farmers of course have a kind of safety net there. If their children um, want to go to school, for instance, or there are extra expenses, uh, these timber trees are often utilized. Is that an answer to the questions? Yeah. Sorry. 
Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Actualmente Costa Rica tiene un 52% del territorio nacional en, eh, en este territorio boscoso, tiene cobertura boscosa. Con estas dos iniciativas de NAMAS, Café y Ganadería, pretendemos al 2030 llegar a un 60% del territorio nacional en cobertura boscosa. Entonces, sí, ya, está, ya estamos llegando a un límite, ya no tendríamos dónde sembrar más árboles. Entonces, efectivamente, queremos eh, el otro año, inicios del otro año, iniciar una discusión y una negociación de tal manera que podamos permitir estos reconocimientos al agricultor a los agricultores y a los, a los de café y a otro tipo de agricultores. Pero lo que quisiéramos avanzar nosotros como Ministerio de Agricultura es que no solo se les reconozca beneficios por árboles maderables, deseablemente, ¿verdad? Podríamos mejorar los ingresos de sus productores si se les permitiera eh, sembrar otro tipo de árboles, por ejemplo, ñeñosas, eh, donde puedan tal vez comercializar frutas u otro tipo de productos. Entonces, es un tema que todavía no está dado a claro, ¿verdad? pero que es un tema que nos gustaría iniciar la discusión y ver cómo beneficiamos mucho más a sus productores y mejorar sus ingresos. I think we have uh, more time for further questions. There was one over there, which was first, um, then on, on the right side and uh, last uh, till. No, over there first, okay. please. Hello everyone, my name is Gustavo Vargas and I work at Climate Focus. Uh, I have a question about agroforestry systems and on the first study we saw as well. Uh, I will also would like you to elaborate a little bit more on the market barriers for timber because what I see is interesting is the additional revenue that will come from implementing an agroforestry si system will come not for an increase in coffee productivity but rather on timber. But yet what we have seen or our experience is that if the market is not there, at the end, this won't really create more income. It just it would just make create actually additional cost to coffee farmers. So so yeah, I, will, I would like you to probably elaborate a little bit more on this. And probably uh, now that we have the vice minister of Costa Rica, probably what is their experience of probably uh, helping the access to market from coffee producers, especially small ones. Thank you. Okay. The next question was over there, please. And then it goes on the other side. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I just have a very straightforward question. I learned recently that 50% of the emissions uh, from the coffee sector are accounted by the upstream uh, part and even consumers. And I'm just wondering what type of initiatives uh, are planned to address these, these emissions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Till Pistorius. Um, I'm working for a company called Unique Forestry and Land Use. And I don't, actually don't have a question to the panelists, but I've just received a message from Dr. Horst Freiberg, who was supposed to sit here on the panel. And he really apologizes uh, that he cannot be here today and make this link that Michael has asked to make. How can we link this interesting initiative and, and all this work and bring it to the political level, a question that was also raised. And he particularly asked me to emphasize that there is a political process going on at the moment, really gaining pace, which is the bond challenge, uh, that is a perfect venue to really bring such initiatives to the political level, to link it to ministers. And the bond challenge has so far taken place as ministerial meetings, including the private sector, twice in Bonn, but is now currently broken down in a number of countries that are relevant for coffee production. So we had the first regional bond challenge recently in, in El Salvador, and there are a number of more bond challenges planned in the future. And my uh, mission with this statement is just to emphasize that this is a perfect venue to associate in future uh, regional bond challenges coming up in the next year. Excellent. Many, many thanks still for the closing remarks. Uh, <laughs> but still, um, two, two more questions to address. Bia, would you like to, to take up the first one? And then Mario, um, the second on um, what do we do with the consumers? Thank you. Um, just to make sure, your question was addressed to me, right? Because you mentioned the first presentation. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, 
your question was about um, uh, timber trees and um, what the barriers are for marketing uh, timber tree products. Um, in fact, in the field, uh, we observed a variety of timber trees uh, that are utilized. Although uh, a lot of farmers have a strong emphasis on the use of inga trees, uh, inga trees for the purpose of providing shade uh, to coffee, and not all of them uh, are marketing uh, their products. Uh, on the other hand, there is also the valuable timber tree of mahogany and uh, some other species that are more valuable. Of course, you can imagine that if you can grow a mahogany tree, the marketing in the end is probably not so much of a problem. So it depends very much on the type of uh, species uh, selected. And I agree with you that uh, some market barriers uh, need to be um, solved uh, regarding uh, the use of timber trees. I'm not sure, Rosaline, whether you would like to complement something to this answer? Yeah, maybe I can complement it a little bit. Uh, we actually uh, recently did a, um, a workshop in Peru to, to also sort of um, discuss the results that we obtained there. And actually the, the forestry products or the timber products were um, was a big discussion point, uh, also because of the market access. Um, but there were very practical questions there from the people who were uh, uh, part of the workshop. So I think it really emphasizes that although it's a, it's a big, it could be a big opportunity, there are a lot of uh, difficulties that need to be overcome. So market access is, is one of them. But I think uh, another very important one is the maintenance of the timber trees if they are on the farm. Because we also saw that even though some farmers, they have the timber trees, they are standing on the farm. But if they are not managed properly, then yeah, your coffee yield will go down. Uh, so And also the, uh, the, the people who were there also from coffee cooperatives, they were really asking, okay, so these are your results. So which tree species should we plant now? And we could not give this, this answer, but I think that's an important question that they would like the practical answers of what type of tree species, what maintenance can we do, and how can we market them? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to take advantage on that a little bit because we did look at several projects that are using timber and linking this to carbon. And it's actually, it works really interesting because through the carbon component, you enter this long-term um, technical support and then the projects also are investing quite a lot of efforts in trying to use this timber at the end of the project because that's what's going to give this continuity. So Gold Standard is working in this in Peru. There's also Plan Vivo. There's many examples of projects that are doing this. And the carbon component is the bit that is tipping over into the monitoring and the long-term um, um, stay of this project. Okay, <clears throat> yes. Uh, yes, you're right, more or less 50-50 uh, between uh, the, 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 say, the upstream and, and downstream. What is the industry doing? Uh, in principle, you can, you can have uh, uh, two areas of activity. One is, let's say, the general uh, improvement uh, in efficiency in the production, in the uses of the transports and all that stuff that you would do anyway. And the other one is, uh, is, uh, is a more, let's say, connected to the single process. So, for example, you, 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 you have improvement in the, in the processing, in the roasting process, uh, you have improvement in the machine, uh, and many of these things are connected into uh, uh, energy saving and uh, carbon reduction almost uh, automatically. Uh, I just want to like to remember as well that the European Commission is actually working right now on what is called PEF, a product environmental footprint, which is basically uh, a, a, an approach to calculate uh, the whole, uh, uh, well, from, from the beginning, the whole cradle to grave um, uh, environmental footprint of uh, many products, and, and coffee is one. And uh, I suspect that at the end, that will result in an indication to the consumer, which will actually be able to uh, also to, to make his own choices also on the basis of, um, of the carbon uh, footprint. So yeah, that does more or less is the, is the state of the art, uh, the state of the art situation. More in general, what I, I, I think uh, there, there will be 
um, well, hopefully also coming from from here, from what is, is going on in, in Cow 21 now, there will be probably a, a push into balancing uh, emission, but uh, but that has to be based, of course, on a more global uh, global situation. No, uh, you cannot really do it on a specific single cup of coffee, of course. You're welcome. Okay, with that, we have to close the panel. Thank you so much for um, actively participating in the discussions. I think much more will need to be discussed and uh, much more needs to be uh, discovered and explored. It becomes very clear that um, I think more coherence needs to come in our answers um, when addressing the next steps to, to come. Um, with this, I would like to, to hand over then to, well, first of all, a quick applause maybe for our panelists. <laughs> and then handing over to, to Serge for closing the session. Okay. Is it, is it, yes, it's working. Well, th thank you very much for this uh, very, uh, I think we had a very interesting session. Lots of uh, things came across. Uh, it's to us to try to summarize this. I will not do this in the last minute. We will certainly use also the GLF website and our other communication um, websites, etc., to share this information. If you go out, there might be some uh, hard copies of the researches left on the desk. I don't, I'm not sure. Otherwise, you can certainly find them also on our website. And maybe last question, uh, it's often asked to HIFOS, uh, HIFOS as a development organization, why are you still into coffee after 25 years? I think this is exactly the reason. Uh, coffee is a, is, is a sort of laboratory for us where we can test a lot of ideas and a lot of, uh, uh, the, the sector is very receptive also to innovate and uh, we can really uh, show examples in agriculture that and yes, it's possible. Of course, we have to do a lot of things to make it possible. Um, one of these things that we recently launched is the SAFE platform, which is the um, Sustainable Agriculture, Food and the Environment platform that's focusing on Latin America, being uh, financed by the Inter-American Development Bank. It's a, it's a multilateral um, community of both private sector, governments and uh, the civil society together to work towards um, a climate smart uh, coffee sector. Um, furthermore, last but not least, also mentionable is last week, our colleagues of uh, Conservation International, they launched the uh, Sustainable Coffee Challenge, which is also focusing on pri uh, including private sector and uh, civil society in the next 100 days to come up with a plan to make coffee the first sustainable commodity. So you're all invited to join. Please uh, check their website, check our website, and in the next 100 days, we are going to make a brilliant plan. Thanks.